competition. And uh, we're going to have a very special guest speaker this time, Mr. Jeff Warner. And I will let, uh, we will start this up in about 30 seconds. Doesn't look like anybody's joined. I'm actually Jeff. I'm sorry, Warren. Jeff Warren. I'm <laughs> not Kurt. Correct Warren. me. Correct me. So I uh, I get bad with names. All right, let's go ahead and start this up. This is Pints with Pete for September 2014. We're going to talk about evacuate and charge. Uh, this is a topic that uh, we somewhat leave up. Remember, with the Unico system, until the I-Series came about, we did not have the, we did not make the condensing unit. So this was a space that was kind of left open for you based upon what the manufacturer's recommendations were. So this is something that's caused a little bit of controversy. This is something that's a little bit, uh, even within our organization, there's differing opinions on it. So that's why I brought Jeff in. Jeff is a longtime veteran of this industry. You want to tell him a little bit about your background, Jeff? Sure, Pete. Um, I'm Jeff Warren. I was, uh, I kind of grew up in the industry with Sporland Valve Company. I worked for them in Canada and later the U.S. and became the um, national wholesale sales manager for Sportland. And um, that's kind of where I grew up in this industry. I was with them for 32 years. And uh, Pete has asked me to stop by today and, and talk to you fellas about um, what's the best way that I can think of to charge a system. So that's why we're here today. So uh, we're going to kind of turn this over to Jeff here because he's the expert and we're going to talk about, you know, first we have to evacuate the system before we charge it. So let's talk a little bit about that, Jeff, if you would. Sure. Before we, before we even get rolling on how to charge the system or even evacuate it, uh, it's, it there's more to it. I think, than just hooking up a vacuum pump to a system. Before you do that and start drinking your coffee, there's a couple of things that I think are very important to consider. And uh, one of those, let's see, a little tech, standby for technical difficulties here. There we go. One of those considerations is installing a quality filter dryer. And uh, one other consideration that uh, I think is very, not only important, but very helpful for you, the technician, uh, when charging a system and for later visits to this job site. But the most important thing is installing a quality filter dryer. And there's a lot of filter dryers out there on the market. And to you guys, they all look the same on the outside. But the most important thing or factor of a, a quality filter dryer is not what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside. And what's it going to do to protect your system? Contaminants can come from uh, or enter a system from the installation or service, uh, and, or it can also be created within the system if the, uh, for example, if head pressures are way too high, discharge pressures, or sorry, discharge temperatures would be quite high, and then you get into oil breakdown, uh, which can also cause acids. So I don't know if you guys have ever just finished, cop, you know, cutting a piece of copper and then you, you deburr it and then you take it and you just go right in the end of it. I know I have. I think we all have at some point or another. Well, we've just entered uh, or we just allowed some contamination to enter that piece of pipe. But anyway, let's move on. Contaminants 
come in various forms. The worst one is acid, and this is formed um, in the system. It's not something you add to the system during installation. Moisture, moisture can be in the system and it can be added in the system, just like my previous example when you blew in the, uh, the end of the pipe, you've just entered, you've just allowed moisture to enter um, either in the form of condensation or just damp air from your, your very own lungs. And then, of course, there's foreign matter, whether it be steel filings um, could come, steel filings can come from what might have been in a receiver or an accumulator. Also, copper chips uh, can come from installation. Now, there's also wax, sludge and varnish. These things are not usually um, seen in air conditioning and heat pump applications. Those two contaminants are generally on the refrigeration side of things when we get into really low uh, suction pressures and temperatures and very high discharge temperatures. Now, acid exists in two forms. It can be in the lubricant from the oil decomposition. Or it can also be in the form of a gas, and that's also from refrigerant breakdown due to high discharge temperatures. Well, how do you get high discharge temperatures? Well, you could overcharge a system, but you could also have outside influences like uh, dogwood trees that make condensers outside look like a big bale of cotton. You have definite air restriction and we're not getting rid of the heat that we want to and this also causes high discharge temperatures and oil breakdown. Foreign material can be oxide scale, dirt, metallic particles, even flux during installation. Um, this damages your compressor. It affects valve operation if you have an expansion valve. And if you do not have an expansion valve, you may have a just a simple pressure reduction type um, slide valve or cap tubes. POE lubricant suspends and circulates large amounts of debris. That's one difference between the old systems with R22 that used mineral oil. If dirt was found a nice hiding spot in the system, mineral oil just pretty much left it there. And it resided there in that elbow or in that receiver forever. But POE lubricants, which are now used with 410A, have a scrubbing action, and that's going to bring back a lot of contaminants that with R22 never did come back to the compressor. So I have no allegiance anymore to Sporlin. However, I still believe it, it's the best filter dryer. And they're about the only company that's willing to show you what's inside, and this is why it's the best. It's designed to remove a variety of contaminants. It's compatible with all the refrigerants and lubricants. And it's the most advanced filter dryer available. Here. Sometimes you have to click this. There you go. <clears throat> There's, you'll notice in the previous slide that the the catch-all is a complete core, and that core is made up of two basic types of desiccant. One is molecular sieve, and the other is activated alumina. And you're going, so what? Well, first, it's got molecular sieve because molecular sieve has a very high water removal capability. However, if we just had molecular sieve, we don't have much to attack any acids that might be in the system. So that's when we come to the other um, ingredient or desiccant. But first, I just want to show you how molecular sieve works on um, water and not very well on acids. Here's a, this is very microscopic, and here's just a granule of molecular sieve, and you see these tiny pores. There are very small pores, just like the water molecule. Very simple, small molecule H2O. 
that little molecule can get in these pores and it's trapped in there forever. Acid molecules, refrigerant molecules, oil and uh, oil additive molecules are very large molecules and will never fit in these tiny pores of molecular sieve. But how, it's, how large are they? Let's talk about actual size of these pores, Jeff. Well, how many microns are these? Gosh, that's a good question. I really, I don't know. How big? I think a human hair is something oh, like that, 139 microns. That's huge. That's huge. Okay. We're talking microscopic. Okay. We're talking molecular you down at the molecular, molecular level, level okay. here. All right. I don't have a ruler that would no. measure anything this small. No. But that, this is what we're dealing with. Now, like I said, the other desiccant that they use is activated alumina. It has a very high acid capability and not very good water capability. And here's why. We're looking at this, again, from a molecular level. Uh, it does have uh, passageways and pores and canals. And you see in this slide that water molecules will get in there, but they could also easily escape. The thing is, water in molecular sieve is adsorbed, like, or sorry, absorbed. That's A-B-S-O-R-B. Just like sponge absorbs water, it's caught in the pores. Acid has an affinity for activated alumina, and it will just stick to the sides of these pores. That's why the pores are larger, and it has a very good capability to remove acid from your system. So what they did is combined both those into a molded core. So now you have both desiccants that attack everything that could enter your system. There's another dryer on the market, and that's a loose fill dryer. And there's so many loose fill dryers out there. But if you go with loose fill, half of that um, filter dryer is just fiberglass pad, and that's their filter media. The catch-all on the left, it's a molded core, and the porosity of that core is very closely controlled, and that's your fil filtering media. So, and you'll see on the right, you've only got half the amount of desiccant rather than a full shell of desiccant. The other thing with loose fills is if we look at this a little closer, the, the action through a loose fill dryer is very violent. You have liquid refrigerant flowing through here at a very quick rate, and it causes these uh, granules, loose fill granules, to rub together, and some break off, some just powder away, and go into your system. Now, if we remember right from the start, the other consideration I thought of was a um, site glass or a liquid moisture indicator. That's what's usually available. So the question is, where is the best place to install the site glass? If we look at this diagram as a system, ideally, and the best way for you, is right ahead of the expansion device. Now, there's a few facts. <clears throat> that you should all know. No matter what company made the thermostatic expansion valve on your system, they all are designed to receive 100% liquid refrigerant at the valve inlet. They are not designed to receive liquid and vapor. If you feed an expansion valve with liquid and vapor, the capacity the rated capacity of that expansion valve is reduced 50%. So if you have a three-ton system and you put, <clears throat> excuse me, you put a three-ton valve on that system, everything looks great unless you feed that valve with liquid and vapor. That would be bubbles in the liquid line. That valve is only good for one and a half tons. You cannot expand a bubble. It already has expanded. That's why it's a bubble. So the seal in front of the expansion valve, when that seal clears up and there are no bubbles, that's going to help. 
you're going to know that 100% liquid is feeding that expansion valve. So, any... I yes. just wanted to make a point, just to reiterate, that we had Ron Beckley from Sporland in here a couple months ago, and he said the biggest problem with valves, when there is a problem with the return of a valve, it is related to contaminant in the system. So this is very important that we follow this uh, evacuation procedure. Yeah, I, I can agree with what Ron said. Um, out of all the valves that came back, 95% of them had foreign material in them, causing them not to work properly. So, so to charge the system, the first thing I would suggest is get your hoses on there and pull a vacuum down to 500 microns. But use a micron gauge, not a manifold gauge. Your manifold gauge cannot measure 500 microns. So that's an electronic gauge. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, and they're, uh, most guys have them, and mm -hmm. if they don't, they're readily available. Right, very, Robin Air has it. And very competitively yeah, priced. Any wholesaler will, will have one or two different manufacturers uh, available to you for okay. micron gauges. Mm -hmm. Also, what's important is to use the hoses that are intended for pulling a vacuum. Again, not your manifold gauge hoses. A lot of you may not know this, but... Um, your manifold gauge hold hoses are built to hold a pressure. However, when you put a vacuum on those hoses, the walls of those hoses break down and the hoses can actually leak. So if you use your manifold gauges with the hoses, not necessarily the gauges, but the gauge hoses, uh, when you're pulling a vacuum, you can actually be sucking moisture into the system rather than pulling it out with your vacuum pump. So that's important. The other thing is those hoses that you find on your gauge manifold set, they have um, Schrader valve depressors in them. That also restricts the area that you have to pull a vacuum from. So it's, uh, it comes down, it's very difficult to uh, shove a marshmallow through a keyhole. <laughs> and that's basically what you're trying to do if you use the hoses off your manifold set. There are hoses available that have no restrictions, and uh, you can pull a uh, good vacuum a lot quicker. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so when you're certain there are no leaks, which means the system holds a vacuum, you simply charge the high side with liquid refrigerant. When it doesn't take any more liquid, you can set the system up and top it up with vapor refrigerant on the low side until you reach a full sight glass. This is the point. This, at this point, that's when you can go and enjoy your coffee. Because until that sight glass clears up, you don't have any subcooling. When the side glass does clear up, you do have subcooling wherever. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. I got a little cold. I'm sorry. sorry. Um, when that side glass does clear up, you have subcooling exactly where that side glass is installed. I think the best place, as I said before, is in front of the expansion valve. But in some cases, that's not available. And you may have to put it just on the liquid line on the outlet of your condensing unit, that tells you that at that point you have subcooled liquid, but not necessarily at the expansion valve. Just keep that in mind. And some Unico systems actually, um, they're separated. The condensing unit is separated from the um, evaporator coil uh, by as much as 30 feet because some Unico systems are in uh, attic spaces. So you also have to allow enough subcooling to overcome that vertical lift. It's basically um, uh, half a pound per foot. So if you had a 30-foot lift, you're, you're going to have to have enough subcooling to make up for a 15-pound drop in pressure. And, and, and that's been very important with Unico because a lot of our systems, probably the vast majority of them, are on an attic, possibly 
20, 25 feet up, something that's very important. So glad you covered that. That's something we're a little different with than the average installation. Now, most manufacturers of condensing units do have a table. And it's basically uh, uh, dependent upon the outdoor temperature the day you're charging the system. And then if it's 75, they're probably looking for around 10 to 15 degrees subcooling. Um, but all manufacturers of condensing units have these tables available to you. But again, it's important. You're measuring the, if you're measuring the subcooling at the outlet of the condenser, make sure you have enough to overcome any vertical lift because it's basically half a pound per foot of lift. And it doesn't matter what size the liquid line is. Could be, could be three eighths, it could be one and one eighth. It doesn't matter. If the, it's the same thing. One, one pound lift is half a pound drop. Jeff, one question. If you do see a bubble in your sight glass, is that cause for alarm necessarily? Um, well, if, if I'm assuming you're there to see the bubbles uh -huh. because you got a call. Okay. So I'm gathering there's a problem. Okay. Uh, contractors just don't go around. That's true. They say, don't generally go to houses. No. To how you, to how, the right. How you doing today? Okay. I want to look at your sight glass. So it's a nice tool. Also, uh, I mentioned earlier, I'd, rather than just a plain sight glass, most things that are available today are moisture liquid indicators. Mm -hmm. And that also will uh, show you how dry your system is, because there is a color indicator in those uh, um, moisture liquid indicators. So um, it, it'll also be clear whether we have a problem. <coughs> so, but that, as far as charging the system is concerned, that's about um, all I have to offer. Uh, I think if you follow these guidelines, you should have a, a really uh, well-running system when you uh, drive away in your truck. So let me just ask you a question here as the expert, Jeff. Now, if you just go by sight glass alone, um, is that going to be sufficient? No, because all it's telling you is we now have subcooling wherever that sight glass is installed, whether it's up at the expansion valve that's what we like, but that just tells us we have about one degree subcooling when that sight glass clears up. How much is actually um, recommended by the condenser manufacturer? Mm -hmm. At that point, you're going to have to put your coffee down and start measuring how much subcooling you really do have. What about superheat? What the, what the, uh, how does superheat factor into this equation? Do we check the pressure? Do we check the superheat at the same time that we're charging? Or uh, you can most I would think most uh, actually I know on Unico systems they have uh, expansion valves on their uh, evaporators that are factory preset mm -hmm. to their um, spec. So Unico has done a lot of testing yes, we have. With, with an, what happens is they do a lot of testing with an adjustable expansion valve and they adjust it on their systems to exactly where they like it. Then the, the, that valve that they adjusted is taken back and, and it's tested for the air test setting and that creates the spec for the new non-adjustable expansion valves. They have the same setting. So one, there's not a lot you can do with non-adjustable valves anyway. The superheat is pretty much permanent setting. Mm -hmm. um, but realize one thing, an expansion valve is kind of a dumb valve. All it knows is one thing, and that's superheat. That's right. it. It's not a pressure regulator. It, if your temperature's not cold enough, but your superheat is good, I'm say, thinking 8 to 10 degrees superheat, it, the expansion valve is not a temperature control. Temperature is a function of compressor. Um, all it knows is superheat. And if that's all you take away today, you're ahead of the game. <laughs> now, one thing, Jeff, our coils are a little colder than most air conditioning coils. Originally, 
back when you were calling on us, uh, we were setting them for about 40 degrees, now about 44 degrees. But that's still, we still get about a 25 degree delta T over our coil under the ideal conditions. So uh, I think what that means is when you're charging the system, you're going to have a little bit lower suction pressure on cooling than you would with a standard uh, air conditioner. Is that Am I correct on that assumption? Well, again, temperature is a function of compressor. If you have enough compressor, yeah, your temperature is going to be a little lower. Mm -hmm. uh, but our standard, uh, my standard evap temperature, if I ever had to do any selections at all, and I'm not told exactly what the temperature is of the evaporator, if it's air conditioning, I always go at 40 degrees. And, and that's what those valves are set up for. Right. And so we've got the I Not, series from Portland, which is factory yes. set, and you can't play around with it. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I also believe you get uh, it's a BI, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, a balanced ported valve. Correct. And they are excellent. They they are not. One thing no textbook ever talks about is that fourth pressure, the liquid pressure coming into the valve. And the reason textbooks don't talk about it, because valve manufacturers have taken care of that in the design of the valve. But what happens and what valve manufacturers do not have control of is when condensing temperatures and pressures change. Outdoor temperatures will change. And that's going to change the inlet pressure on valves. Uh, so. One thing a balanced ported expansion valve has over the others is that liquid pressure on its inlet has no effect on the valve's performance. It truly acts off the three pressures that you've all grown up to know expansion valves work off of. The bulb pressure is the one opening pressure. The evaporator pressure is a closing pressure. And in Unico's um, situation, there is also a spring. If it's an adjustable valve, that spring is your adjustment. But in Unico's case, it's set at a certain spring tension to accomplish the right amount of superheat. But those are your three pressures that valves, you all grew up to know expansion valves work off of. And on a balanced port valve, that truly is what it works off of. The inlet pressure has no bearing at all uh, on the valve performance. The head pressure can swing up and down all over the place. The valve will still control superheat properly. Well, Jeff, that's great. Uh, as you just kind of see, we have a new product, our I-Series by Unico. That will use an electronic expansion valve. And these systems are basically pre-charged from the factory. In the case of the three-ton unit, it's pre-charged for 131 feet. Uh, you can extend that to 210 feet, but it's going to be very rare. It's almost always pre-charged. Uh, again, you're getting into a valve that I think in our case has 1,590 stops. Uh, did I get that number? Oh, I think it's 1,580. Uh, 1,580, okay. It's, a, it's an electric valve, and it's got a step motor. And that step motor moves the pin in and out of the valve port. And it does so like a ratcheting uh, action. And each, each click is one step either up or down. And you talk about very close and tight resolution. Um, if you've got a valve that has a total of 1,580 steps, that's 1,580 positions. <laughs> and the whole stroke of the valve from full close to full open is only about 30 thou of an inch. Wow. So you put 1,580 steps into 30 thou of an inch, uh, that's very close resolution. So the analogy I've been using with everyone is a TXV is a carburetor and electronic expansion valve that's is a fuel injector. That's a great analogy. And so you don't see too many carburetors out there anymore. We're going to be using the TXV for some time. Uh, we've had a very long experience with them. Uh, we have customers that are uh, very happy with what we have. But I, I really think the future of the industry is the inverter technology. So Absolutely. we'll be hearing more about that. And Jeff, 
you did a great job. You want to give these guys your, your email address? We don't have anybody live on here, but uh, we have questions. Uh, we'd like to hear them. And, and Jeff is really the one to ask because I'm going to say, let me get with Jeff. Because if I don't know something, I don't make something up. So you want to give me your email address, Jeff? Sure. My email address is the letter J, the letter S, as in Stephen, Warren, W A R R E N five six at gmail dot com. And of course mine is Pete P E T E at Unicosystem dot com. And again, uh, I hope that we have people watch this on our recording. This is one of the best ones we've had. We may have a we may have a repeat performance of this, Jeff, and uh, Certainly enjoyed your coming in here and giving your expertise on this. So well, thanks for the opportunity, Pete. And hope to be working with you. So uh, everybody, thank you. Uh, be safe. Be safe this weekend and uh, enjoy yourself. And again, stand stand by for another pints with Pete. We'll be doing that the last Friday in October. Thank you all. <laughs>